at, uh, at this point in Hosea chapter 6. We have left behind the symbolic story of the always faithful Hosea married to his habitually unfaithful wife, Gomer. And while Hosea and Gomer actually experienced and lived out all that we earlier read, nonetheless, it was all divinely orchestrated. As an illustration of God's relationship with unfaithful Israel, which for the time being is only referring to the portion of Israel known as the Northern Kingdom, also called Ephraim Israel. Now, shortly, new illustrations and different metaphors are going to be introduced to further describe Israel's condition and what they can expect to happen. So, let's reread the rather short Hosea chapter 6. Open up your Bibles to Hosea chapter 6 and we will read that chapter yet again. Hosea chapter 6. Come, let us return to Adonai, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has struck, he will bind our wounds. After two days he'll revive us, and on the third day he'll raise us up. And we will live in his presence. Let us know, let us strive to know Adonai, that he will come is as certain as morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rains that water the earth. Ephraim, what should I do to you? Judah, what should I do to you? For your faithful love is like a morning cloud, like dew that disappears quickly. This is why I have cut them to pieces by the prophet, slaughtered them with the words from my mouth. The judgment on you shines out like light. For what I desire is mercy, not sacrifices, knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, just like men, have broken the covenant. They have been faithless in dealing with me. Gilead is a city of criminals, covered with bloody footprints. Just as bands of robbers wait to ambush someone, so does a gang of priests. They commit murder on the road to Shechem. Their conduct's an outrage. In the house of Israel, I've seen a horrible thing. Whoring is found there in Ephraim. Israel's defiled, and for you too, Judah, a harvest will come. Now, the first three verses of chapter 6 are Israel collectively speaking. Now, of course, this is figurative of Israel communally pleading and, and, and praising Jehovah for His mercy and for their certainty that He will take them back as their national God. At verse 4, it switches to God doing the speaking. Now, near the close of our previous lesson, I asked you to make a note in your Bibles of a far-reaching principle that's only rarely ever touched upon. It is this. Biblically, in all cases, all cases, when it is spoken of to know God or to have knowledge of God, it is used as an expression. It doesn't mean that a person is to become aware of God, as conveyed by the common question a Christian might ask another person, do you believe in God? That is, are you aware of God to such an extent that you believe He exists? Rather, to know God means one thing alone. It refers to a close and faithful relationship not only with the commandments and laws of God's moral law code, that's the law of Moses, but also with the giver of that law, Jehovah. And such a knowledge is completely wrapped up in the concept of covenant. Thus, when verse 3 begins, let us know, let us strive to know, Yehovah. It means aim to commit 
to a restored and renewed obedience to the moral principles of God's Torah. Because within the Torah is the description of who God is. It is the abandonment of these principles by Israel that has led to their disastrous situation. So now, in verse 4, God responds to Israel's declaration in verses 1 through 3. And if I could just sum up <laughs> Yehovah's response in, in, in a few words, it would be this. You saying to me, eh, my bad, sorry about that, that isn't going to do. Admitting bad behavior is a good thing. But such an admission does not warrant a divine get-out-of-jail-free card. In Christian parlance, such an admission is called a confession. But confession simply means one has acknowledged their crimes, their sin. To God. Forgiveness does not flow from confession, only from actual repentance. And even then, far from a deep and sincere internal sorrow for our behavior, actual change in our behavior and our decisions has to occur. Not merely intent, real, lasting change, true change. You know, that can take a lot of time, often depending on just how far for how long one has strayed from God and His ways. Now, yes, God knows our hearts, but He also knows if we're serious. Then the question becomes, can we be serious and committed to real change for more than just a few hours or days? So it's not only the seriousness of our repentance that brings forgiveness, it must include acting it out in a permanent way. At what point exactly does God forgive us for our confessed bad behavior? I don't know. Adding to the complication of knowing the when of it is that being forgiven by no means indicates that the bad consequences for our actions are going to be taken away. Indeed, from a spiritual sense, forgiveness could come rather quickly, even though the earthly consequences could be going on for a long time. The consequences for Israel, think about this, the consequences for Israel have gone on for 27 centuries. You know, one of my favorite movies is O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Now, this may sound like a Christian film. I assure you it is not. The setting is the Depression-era South, when three not very smart criminals escape from a chain gang, and now they're trying to outrun the law. And at one point, they've stolen a car. And they are driving down this serene country road when suddenly they hear faint singing off in the distance. And one of the escapees, he hollers for the driver, stop the car immediately. And he jumps out and he runs straight to where the voices are coming from. And there at the lake are a line of people in white robes singing while waiting their turn to be baptized. Well, he dashes to the front of the line and gets dunked. And walking back to the car, he has a look of complete relief on his face and in his body language. And he suggests that his fellow thugs should do the same because he says, all my sins are forgiven, and that includes that piggly wiggly I knocked off too. And as they continue their journey, he's explaining to the other two that he's now free and clear. There's nothing more for him 
to worry about. Now, the leader of the pack, however, he suggests that perhaps the good Lord has forgiven him, but he's not so sure that the governor of Mississippi is going to take that similar view. This is, I think, a comical but most apt illustration of how our sins are dealt with in the heavenly sphere as opposed to the earthly sphere. As such, it also represents how God is about to explain to a seemingly repentant but still wayward Israel that although a measure of forgiveness will eventually occur, nonetheless, on earth, there is going to be a long series of just punishments for their long running and determined defenses against him. So verse 4 begins with a sort of sarcastic, what should I do for you, or with you, or I think more likely to you, Ephraim, and you, Judah. Now clearly, at least to me and to a number of bi uh, biblical scholars, there's an issue here. This mention of Judah at this point seems very much out of place. Back in chapter 1, after God has pronounced judgment against Ephraim Israel, saying he will show them no pity or no mercy, he next says in verse 7 of chapter 1, but I will pity the house of Judah. I will save them, not by bow, sword, battle, horses, or cavalry, but by Adonai their God. So, for the time being, Judah is not going to be subjected to God's wrath because they are not behaving the same as Israel. Yet, here we encounter in Hosea 6.4 the inclusion of Judah in the same judgment Israel's to receive. Now, I'm most reluctant ever to question the correctness of Holy Scripture as we have it. Yet, we must always remember we do not possess the originals, but rather only copies, and very often from varying sources. And all ancient copies were hand copied, an enormous task. And further, because sometimes we possess multiple copies of various Bible books, that have come from different ancient sources, we'll find they don't all perfectly match. There can be slight differences. Now, human beings did the copying. Human beings can make simple copyist mistakes, and they can add things for what they believe is the sake of clarity or something they think needs to be said in hindsight. Sometimes they may have been right to do so, other times not. The bottom line is there is just no way that the word Judah belongs here. Even historically, we know that God's judgment wouldn't come against Judah for another 130 years after Israel's, and the judgment would come from a different enemy. It would play out quite differently. Israel's from Assyria, the people scattered over multiple continents, for nearly three millennia. Judah's from Babylon, the people taken off together in a relatively compact area and exiled for less than a hundred years. And since over and over we find this use of couplets in, in Hosea, you can refer to earlier lessons if you don't remember what a couplet is, then I have no doubt that a later editor substituted Judah for Israel, probably around the time Judah was invaded, maybe not long after, Amos had written his prophecy about Judah. So the opening of this verse nearly certainly originally said something like, what should I do to you, Ephraim? What should I do to you, Israel? Because Ephraim and Israel are regularly employed in couplet form throughout the book of Hosea. Well, continuing in verse 4, Israel is told, that what they insist is, oh, it's faithful love toward Jehovah is like a cloud in the morning, or dew that forms early, early in the day, something that appears and then quickly dissipates. That is, it is sincere for an instant, then it's not. Their faithful love is neither faithful nor love. Time and again, the Holy Scriptures pound home 
that loving God means obeying God. We can insist we love him, even demonstrating the warmest feelings towards him, but the only way he accepts our love is in the form of obedience. Uh, but obedience to what? Obedience to the law of Moses. It's the one and only divinely given moral code that exists in the Bible, Old and New Testaments. It seems to me that our loving and merciful God is showing us, in, in humanly emotional terms, a sense of a current hopelessness of Israel's condition. Every attempt he has made to get their attention in order to reform them has ended in failure. In one sense, verse 4 is a rhetorical question. But in another sense, it's a statement of reality. He is certainly not inquiring of Israel about how he had to go about dealing with them. Rather, he is responding as an exasperated father to an ex a defiant child. Therefore, God says in verse 5 that it is because of all these frustrated efforts on his part to cure Israel's rebelliousness that he, metaphorically speaking, cuts them to pieces by the prophets, slays them by the words of his mouth. So, verse 5 answers the rhetorical question that was asked in verse 4 as to what's to be done to Ephraim Israel. Now, hearing what the ancient rabbis and scholars have to say about various passages in uh, the Holy Scriptures, it can prove to be quite instructional. It needs to be taken very seriously. The Venerable Rashi says that the, exist the essence of what verse 5 means is, because I warned you through the agency of prophets and you did not repent, I brought upon you death, because you, Israel, transgressed the word which expressed my will, and now my judicial punishment comes forth as light." Now speaking of God's judgment going forth as light is not meant in the good sense as light is usually presented in the Bible. Rather, light here is used as a metaphor in the sense that light bursts forth complete all at once. It just happens. You can no more stop the light than you can stop the earth from rotating. Further, light exposes and reveals what had been hidden in darkness. That God's own people, Israel, have these divinely caused calamities happening to them reveals for all to see that the cause is their sinfulness and unfaithfulness. Verse 6, now, verse 6. This has to be one of the most quoted and misused verses in all of Holy Scripture. And it says this, at least it does in the complete Jewish Bible. For what I desire is mercy, not sacrifices, knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, this is regularly used in the Christian faith to prove that the Law of Moses is abolished and that the sacrificial system was at best deficient, at worst, a complete failure. You know, it's disappointing that such a mistruth is told and repeated, if not embedded, in the world view of the institutional church. And I'm telling you, reform is needed. Let's begin mid-verse with the key phrase, knowledge of God. Recall what I taught you earlier. To know God or to have knowledge of God means one thing alone in the Bible, to be devoted, loyal, and obedient to the law, and consequently to the law giver, or maybe vice versa. Here's what God is explaining. But first, understand that the sacrifices of the kind mentioned here only have to do with sins. They have nothing to do with vow offerings or, or thanksgiving sacrifices or 
first fruits, sacrifices, or so on. Just sin. Now, the sacrificial system, as regards sin, this is a means to rescue humans from the death they, we justly deserve for our, our offenses against God. This rescue is accomplished by means of substituting a fully innocent creature on the sinner's behalf. So, if, if one had knowledge of God, presumably, obedience and devotion to the law and to the lawgiver, that it would necessarily result in God's people showing mercy instead of harm to our fellow man. So, no sacrificial or burnt offering would even be needed because there'd be no crimes for which atonement would be necessary. That's the logic behind this. You know, it's like telling your angry child, <clears throat> just after you've sentenced him to being grounded for the weekend, that such a punishment would not exist or occasionally applied if they just obey the house rules. And as a parent, we tell them that we would prefer never to have to ground you because we love you. We get no joy in this. But because you disobey and you do wrong, we have instituted a grounding system to try to rescue you from doing something even worse. And then hopefully, through this punishment, see that obedience is the better path. You know, it's, it, I think it's most interesting that Yeshua actually referred to this passage, this passage in Hosea, in one of his teachings. We find it in Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. He says that we read this here. It says, While Yeshua was in the house eating, many tax collectors and sinners came and joined him and his Talmudim, his disciples, at the meal. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his uh, disciples, Why does your rabbi eat with tax collectors and sinners? But Yeshua heard their question and answered, The ones who need a doctor aren't the healthy but the sick. As for you, go and learn what this means. I want compassion rather than animal sacrifices, for I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners. Next, John's disciples came to him and asked, Why is it that we and the Pharisees fast frequently, but your disciples don't fast at all? And Yeshua said to them, Can wedding guests mourn while the bridegroom is still with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. Then they will fast. See, in one sense, Jesus was saying to the Pharisees that if they really had open minds to understand who he is, they'd help him, even join him, instead of plotting against him. In another sense, Yeshua was pointing out the Pharisees' increasing concern with ritualistic and mechanical religion and rules that are the result of man-made doctrines, always thinking it was this that would please Jehovah, even though it was actually their defiled inner spiritual condition that made them unacceptable to God. Compassion and mercy are words that express the fundamental God principle of love your neighbor. Now, I want you to hear this, please. If you hear absolutely nothing else today, hear this. If we don't love our neighbor, all the ritual and the religion and the rules following in the world will never make us acceptable to God. Now, beginning in verse 7, God justifies his refusal to accept Israel's repentance, which he sees as fleeting, thus insincere. Hosea 6 7. But they, just like men, have broken the covenant. They've been faithless in dealing with me. Or, other Bible versions deal with this very difficult verse very differently. Listen, listen to the NRS version, same verse. But at Adam, they transgressed the covenant. There they de dealt faithlessly with me. And the NAS, but like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. See, the issue is with the Hebrew word Adam. It can mean human being. It can mean the name of the first man. It can mean the name of an actual biblical place of a city. 
Good cases have been made for every one of these possibilities, and I think it's toss-up. The meaning is ambiguous. The important thing to notice is that the unfaithfulness of Israel is realized in their breaking of the covenant. And since the book of Exodus, the term covenant, when standing alone, means the covenant God gave to Israel on Mount Sinai, the covenant of Moses, the law. Now this works hand in glove to prove our correct understanding of the term knowledge of God as meaning obedience to the covenant of Moses and then automatically to the one who gave it. Okay? Therefore, God sees Israel transgressing the covenant of Moses, that is breaking the laws contained in that covenant, as dealing treacherously against him and in a most personal way. And such treacheries, treachery is not remedied in some sudden burst of repentance. This treachery has gone on for so long, and its net has been cast so wide that sin is now utterly woven in to Israel's very fabric of society and consciousness. Even when we recognize sin, we can't ever instantly recognize all of it. And even when we sincere, sincerely begin to deal with our unfaithfulness to God, we can never deal with all of its aspects all at once. Sometimes it can be a, a long road back. Well, verse 8 speaks of the place, Gilead, as being a city of criminals. So it might mean that when verse 7 speaks of Adam, it is speaking of the city called Adam, Adam, and I kind of lean in that direction. In any case, it's hard to know which Gilead this might even be speaking about. Gilead technically refers to the territory on the east side of the Jordan River that centuries earlier had been conquered and then, then occupied by the Israelite tribes of Gad, Reuben, and uh, Manasseh. Now there is another place called Remote Gilead where Elisha anointed Yehu as, as king of Israel. There's other Gileads as well. So, I'm really not going to venture a guess as to which one this is speaking of. One clue about what this might be referring to, though, is that we're about to enter some passages in Hosea that are referring to a long series of short-lived kings of Israel. And that's where the reference to Gilead just might come into play. 2 Kings chapter 15 addresses this in some detail. Now we're actually going to read this together at the end of today's lesson. There we find mention of 50 men from a city called Gilead who conspired with Pekah, son of Remaliao, to murder Israel's sitting king, a fellow of the same name, but whose father was King Menachem. So there were two Pekahs, one that immediately came after the other, that sat on Ephraim, Israel's throne. Now this was going to happen around 735 BC, just a little more than a decade before Israel would be attacked and then exiled by Assyria. Well, verse 9 now swings us back to the priests of Israel that God considers, considers as idolaters. And here also paints, paints them as murderers and thugs. And the question is whether these priests actually do ambush people and kill them, or if this is meant as a metaphor. Now, all the way back to chapter 4. Our prophet has been accusing the priests of Israel of leading the people into sin and unfaithfulness. Now, they don't know the difference between right and wrong, even though they think they do. See, this is speaking of the problem of man-made religion and the resultant doctrines that come with it, which Israel's priests have fashioned over the past century. So it seems to me that the priests are being likened 
to a gang of bloodthirsty bandits. Now, it's easy, because it's so self-evident, to point a finger at man-made doctrines as one of the chief reasons for Israel's fall. It's also why our Christian faith for centuries has wandered so far from its Hebraic heritage. What's harder to state is exactly what the problem is. What these doctrines always seem to lead to, out of which come so many sins and deceptions, in my simplistic terms, it is that our foundational sense of justice and mercy, what our choices, what our behaviors reveal, which is bedrock of God's command to love our fellow man as ourselves, it's just not the same as Jehovah's, nor is it what he's commanded. A.J. Heschel says this about that issue. He says, man's sense of injustice is a poor analogy to God's sense of injustice. The exploitation of the poor to us, it's a misdemeanor. To God, it's a disaster. Our reaction is disapproval. God's reaction is something no language can convey. Hebrews and Gentile Christians alike have always, it seems, had a propensity to try and adapt God's sense of justice and mercy as revealed in the Bible to better keep with what it is our culture prefers. Our Western culture admires prosperity and it looks down at poverty. We've taken some of the sins that God lists as the most grievous murder, adultery, idolatry, blasphemy, and our obligation to help the poor and diminish them. See, when I taught the Torah, I asked folks to notice how one of the surest ways to understand how God prioritizes the seriousness of sins is the punishment handed out for each of them. The four I just mentioned are the most serious, and this is characterized by them all requiring the death penalty. In Western society, of the four, only the first is even a crime. And only in a few places does a murderer still even face the death penalty. The other three are considered as personal preferences, with no actual consequences. Even in Christian settings at times, these are tolerated, with only the most minor of consequences, if any whatsoever. Why is that? Because man-made doctrine has pushed aside God's definitions of right and wrong evil and good, what's criminal, what's not, what justice is, what it's not, and then replace these with our own. And in the so doing, we are quite certain we must be right, because most of us agree on it, and we like it, we feel good about it. God labels this as treachery against him. Well, in verse 9, another place name is mentioned. Shechem. Now, no, no doubt all these places must be associated to the northern kingdom's territory. Shechem was a major religious and political center, and had been so since the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Priests are said to commit murder there. And again, the question is, is this murder literal murder, or is it metaphorical? Some rabbis say this is referring to Jacob's sons massacring the residents of Shechem in revenge for the rape of their sister Dinah. I can't buy into that, because this verse is about priests. It's not about Israel in general, and the Levites certainly aren't blamed for the Shechem massacre. In the end, 
it seems most plausible to me that the listing of place names, of which I think Adam, Adam is one of them, is meant as representative of what goes on in the entire territory of Israel. That is, there are no enclaves in Israel where good is being done. I, I think it's kind of like saying from Los Angeles to Chicago to New York as a way of representing the entire USA. Now, I think this idea of the three place names as representative of all the territory of the ten northern tribes is further bolstered by verse 10, which is actually kind of a summary. After calling out three specific places, the conclusion is that the house of Israel, meaning the northern kingdom, all of it and everywhere, has done and is, in doing, and is doing something terrible. They are engaging in prostitution, metaphorically. That is, idolatry is rampant throughout. The result is, Israel is defiled. They have become unclean. Now, the Hebrew word that's rendered unclean is in, uh, in English is tameh. Tame. Now, I want to pause for a moment. I want to explain something about exactly what unclean, tame, actually means. Food is probably a little easier illustration to work with, but it largely works the same actually for classifying people. There are entirely separate laws in the Torah concerning what is permissible and what is prohibited versus what is clean and what is unclean. See, all these terms are often thought to be and are used as two ways to say the same thing. <laughs> they most definitely are not. It works like this. What is permissible, whether it's food, whether it's behavior, whether it's humans, is applied only to God's people. Only. In a sense, then, Gentiles who do not worship Israel's God are not permissible people. They lay outside the system. Now, I know it's, it's an awkward way to say it, but the point is to explain the difference between not permissible and unclean. Hebrews, on the other hand, as God's people by birth, are permissible and they lay inside the system. Food's the same. The food list, as found in Leviticus 7, 11, rather, has nothing to do, nothing to do with clean and unclean. It only has to do with what is permissible and not permissible for food. Once something is identified as permissible, now the laws of clean and unclean can come into play. Any permissible thing always begins in a state of ritual cleanness. However, a permissible thing can be rendered not usable for its purpose, made unclean, made tame, through improper handling or a few other factors. So, for instance, beef. Beef is a permissible food for Israel. In its natural state, this permissible food is clean, it can be eaten. However, if the cow were not to be butchered correctly, or if too much blood was allowed to remain in its meat, or should the meat be left exposed and an unclean mouse tromps around all over it, then the beef becomes unclean therefore not usable. Pig, on the other hand, is inherently not permissible as food in the first place. So, there's no such thing as something being not permissible but clean. Not permissible automatically excludes its use. So, unclean or clean doesn't even apply. So in verse 10, Israel, a permissible 
people, in a matter of speaking, and therefore Israel in its natural state is ritually clean, can, for any number of reasons, become ritually defiled, unclean. One of the ways an Israelite can become unclean is to commit a sin against God. What I call a wash and a wait, that is being immersed in water and then a certain prescribed amount of time passes, this can cleanse the unclean condition of that permissible person. And this, by the way, is separate from atonement. However, a Gentile non-believer cannot do this. Why? Because they're not a member of the permissible people. They can't be defiled because clean and unclean only apply to that which is permissible, and they're not. So, in our passage, permissible Israel has, through its sin of idolatry, been rendered unclean, not usable for the purpose God created them. Still, because they are permissible in the first place, they can be made clean, they can be brought back to their natural state. Now verse 11 again mentions Judah. One of two things is happening here. Either this entire verse is a gloss written in by Judean some years later, or it is original. And the idea is to say that in time, both Judah and Israel will suffer, suffer similar fates. And as with so much of Hosea, scholars disagree over whether the term harvest is meant in the positive or in the negative sense. That is, the harvest of the exiles represents a restoration. And yet, biblically, the term harvest is nearly always taking us to the era of the end times. And it speaks of people and things during a period of end times judgment. So, some harvested, some will be harvested to their good, others harvested to their everlasting unpleasantness. Now, I can only offer you my opinion without particularly being, without being particularly rigid about it. I think in this case, the, Jew, the word Judah actually belongs here. Yeah, it, it, it might be a gloss, and maybe it's not original. But assuming that it is original, the tone of it is that even though Judah and Israel will suffer a similar fate, those fates are going to be separated by time and circumstances. Say it another way. Israel's judgment is now, Judah's comes later. But since exile will be the result, then the judgments for both are similar. All right, let's move on to Hosea chapter 7. Open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 7. Hosea chapter 7. Hosea chapter 7, when I restore the fortunes of my people, when I am ready to heal Israel, the crimes of Ephraim confront me, along with the wickedness of Shomron. For they keep practicing deceit. Thieves break in, bands of robbers raid outside. They never say to themselves that I remember all their evil. Now their own deeds surround them. They are right in front of me. They make the king glad with their wickedness. The leaders with their lies, they're all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker, who doesn't stoke the fire from kneading time till the dough has risen. On their king's special day, the leaders inflame him with wine, and he joins hands with scorners, who ready themselves like an oven while they wait for their chance. Their baker sleeps through the night, then in the morning it bursts into flame. They are all hot as an oven, and they devour their judges. All their kings have fallen. Not one of them calls out to me. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim has become a half-baked cake. Foreigners have eaten up his strength. He doesn't know it. 
Yes, gray hairs appear on him here and there. He doesn't know it. The pride of Israel testifies in his faith, but in, sp- in his face, but in spite of all this, they haven't returned to Adonai either God or sought him. <laughs> Ephraim behaves like a silly, foolish dove, going to Egypt, then to Asher for help, and even as they go, I will spread my net over them. I'll bring them down like birds from the sky. I will discipline them as their assembly was told. Oh, woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, they've wronged me. (laughs) Am I supposed to redeem them when they've spoken lies against me? They've not cried out to me from their hearts, even though they wail on their beds. They assemble themselves for grain and wine, yet turn away from me. It was I who trained and strengthened their arms, yet they plot evil against me. They return, but not upward. They're like an unreliable bow. Their leaders will die by the sword because of their angry talk. They will become a laughing stock in the land of Egypt. Verse 1, chapter 7, more or less as God saying, You know, I wanted to heal Israel from all their iniquity, but the closer I looked, the gravity of their sin and deprivation became all the more apparent and that it emanated from Samaria. Now, Samaria, Shomron in Hebrew, was the seat of government in Israel. The idea is that the political center of Israel bears much of the blame for the condition of Israel. Now, I could probably detour here and easily spend the remainder of the day's lesson on him, but I'm not going to do it. Suffice it to say, nations are defined by their capitals and by those who govern from there. While each human is individually responsible for our own sin, for our own moral condition, the reality is that perhaps the greatest influence over a person's life will come from their government because they control so much of what is possible. The leadership bears a far larger portion of responsibility for the moral state of a nation than a single citizen at large. Is violence and crime rampant? Look to your national leadership. Is your economy in a shambles? Look to your national leadership. Has your nation lost its sense of ethics and morality? Look to your national leadership. And when, as with Ephraim Israel, things seem to be imploding on every level, hopelessness abounds, look to your national leadership. This is God's stated worldview. It's not mine. However, also note that God sees national leadership as consisting of both politicians and priests. The religious leadership cannot say, it's not us, not us, it's those darned politicians. Every nation needs politicians ancient or modern. And history teaches us that the more authoritarian and the further from God that a national government gets, the more the politicians attack those among the nation's religious institutions that will not bend to their moral mindset or to their plans and social agenda. So a strong, a strong religious establishment is needed to speak up, to act with courage, to act with boldness, to counterbalance the politicians. What happens when the counterbalance ceases to be that and instead becomes little more than the religious apologists for the politicians? That nation tips into disaster. This is what we are viewing in the book of Hosea. Hosea. 
Now we get an example of what I was just speaking about in the second half of verse 1 when we're told that, for they keep practicing deceit. Thieves break in, bands of robbers raid outside. Unchecked, deception and lying. Criminals breaking into homes, gangs lying in wait for victims. They're all connected in cause and source. Verse 2 is essentially what verse 1 explained, just a little more detail. The idea concludes that the leadership is being confronted with enemies attacking them, rampant criminality, their economy is failing, the people are behaving irresponsibly, and despite the warning from the prophets, they still don't ascribe it to their own wickedness and lack of faithfulness to Yahweh. Beginning with verse 3, we get into the grisly murders of several kings of Israel each murder committed by the man who wants to be king. Very likely, the overall period of time that this would be carried out spans from roughly 750 to 725 BC. This is recorded, what I just told you. This is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 15. It's worth our while to take a minute and read it. So open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 15. I'll give you a second to get there. 2 Kings chapter 15. It's long, but worth it. We're going to get a flavor here of just what was going on at exactly this time in the life of Ephraim Israel. It was in the 27th year of Jeroboam, the Jeroboam, king of Israel, that Azariah, the son of Matziah, the king of Judah, began his reign. He was 16 years old when he began to rule, and he ruled for 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Yekoliahu uh, 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 from Jerusalem. He did what was right from Adonai's perspective, following the example of everything his father Amatziah had done. However, the high places weren't taken away. The people still sacrificed and offered on the high places. Adonai struck the, ting, struck the king so that he had Sarat until his dying day so that he lived in a separate house while Yotam, the king's son, ran the king's household and was regent over the people of the land. Other activities of Azariah and all his accomplishments are recorded in the annals of the kings of Judah. So Azariah slept with his ancestors the kings of Israel, and they buried him with his ancestors in the city of David. Then Yotam, his son, took his place as king. It was in the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, that Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, began his reign over Israel in Shamron, Samaria. He ruled for only six months. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective, just as his ancestors had done. He did not turn from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, who made Israel sin. Shalom, the son of Avesh, formed a conspiracy against him. He struck him in the presence of the people and killed him. Then he took his place as king. Other activities of Zechariah are recorded in the annals of the kings of Israel. The word of Adonai which he had spoken to Jehu was, Your descendants down to the fourth generation will sit on the throne of Israel. And that is exactly what happened. Shalom, the son of Yavesh, began his reign in the 39th year of Uzziah, king of Judah. He ruled in Samaria for a month. Menachem, the son of Gadi, went up from Tirzah, came to Shamron, and struck Shalom, the son of Yavish, in Shamron, and killed him. Then he took his place as king. Other activity, activities of Shalom and the conspiracy formed are recorded in the annals of the kings of Israel. From Tirzah, Menachem attacked uh, Tifsach, all the people in, it, in its territory, because they had not opened their gates to him. So he sacked the city and ripped apart all of its pregnant women. It was in the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, that Menachem, the son of Gadi, began his reign over Israel. He ruled 10 years in Samaria. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective. Throughout his life, he did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, who made Israel sin. Pul, the king of Asher, invaded the land. Menachem gave Pul 33 tons of silver so that he would confirm Menachem's hold on the kingdom. He did this by taxing the wealthy men in Israel from each he required one and a quarter pounds of silver to give to the king of Asher. Then the king of Asher turned around and left the land. 
Other activities of Maham, Maha, Menachem and all of his accomplishments are recorded in the annals of the kings of Israel. Menachem slept with his ancestors, and Pekiah, his son, took his place as king. It was in the 15th year of Azariah, king of Judah, that Pekiah, the son of Menachem, began his reign over Israel and Samaria. He ruled for two years. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective, and he did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, who made Israel sin. Pekah, the son of Ramalu, one of his commanders, conspired against him, and with Argov, Arye, and 50 men from Gilead, he assassinated him in the palace of the stronghold of Samaria. And after killing him, he took his place as king. Other activities of Pekiah and all his accomplishments are recorded in the annals of the kings of Israel. It was in the 52nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, that Pekah, the son of Ramalia, began to reign over Israel and Samaria. His reign lasted 20 years. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nevat, who made Israel sin. During that time of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath Pileser came from Asher and conquered Ion, Avet Baal Ma'acha, Yanoach, Kadesh, Hatzor, Gilead, and the Galil, all the land of Naphtali, and took them captive to Asher. Hosea, the son of Elah, conspired against Pekah, the son of Ramalia, struck him, killed him, took his place as king in the 20th year of Yotam, the son of Uzziah. Other activities of Pekah and all of his accomplishments are recorded in the annals of the king of Israel. It was in the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, that Yotam, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began his reign. He was 25 years old when he began his reign. He ruled for 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Yerusha, the daughter of Sadok. He did what was right from Adonai's perspective, following the example of everything his father Uzziah had done. However, the high places were not taken away. And the people still sacrificed, offered on the high places. He built the upper gate of the house of Adonai. Other activities of Yotam and all of his accomplishments are recorded in the annals of the kings of Judah. It was during this period that Adonai began sending against Judah Ritzin, the king of Aram and Pekah, the son of Ramalia. Yotam slept with his ancestors and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. His ancestor, then Ahaz, took his place as king. What a mess. What a mess. All right, we'll pick up next week at Hosea chapter 7, verse 3. Okay. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them, merchandise with a meaning, Products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com. For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com. Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.